Hello, uh, good afternoon. Uh, welcome. Um, my name is Brian Jacob. I'm the director of Close Up, the Center for Local, State, and Urban Policy, uh, hosting the event today. Um, uh, this is one of a, a series of public uh, events, talks that we have throughout the year, uh, several of them focusing on uh, education policy issues. Um, I'm going to just uh, thank, brief, briefly thank uh, Bonnie Roberts at Close Up, who has organized this, as well as uh, Sean Nelson, Laura Lee, and some other the staff at the Ford School who have uh, been instrumental in putting this together. I also want to announce uh, to folks that this is um, being, uh, there's a live web stream to the University of Michigan's uh, Detroit Center, and apparently there's an audience who is watching this now uh, at the Detroit Center, so hello out there, um, and I'm glad you could join us. Uh, also, uh, we unfortunately, the date that worked for everyone here was the date of this uh, conference called ASH, the Association for the Study of Higher Education. Um, and so many of the people that wanted to be in the audience today are actually at the conference, so we are also live streaming this to Indiana or wherever Ash is meeting now. Um, but uh, so I hope uh, everyone uh, enjoys this. I'm uh, going to now turn this over to Sue Donarski, a faculty member here at the Ford School um, who specializes in higher education research, and she will be moderating the panel. So thank you very much. Thanks for being here. So uh, we're going to go in the order that you see here. I'm going to um, uh, briefly introduce you to each of the speakers all at the beginning right now, rather than pop up like a jack-in-the-box every time they finish talking. So um, going from right to left here, uh, we have Richard Vetter, uh, and he is senior fellow at the Independent Institute and professor of economics um, at Ohio University. It's not Ohio State, so he can be here. Uh, he's got a PhD in economics from the University of Illinois and has been senior economist at the U.S. Joint Economic Committee. Um, he publishes widely on higher education and his uh, articles and reviews have appeared in numerous scholars, scholarly journals as well as the op-ed pages of the Wall Street Journal, um, uh, the Washington Times, National Review. Um, Chris Mullen, uh, to his left, is the program director for policy analysis at the American Association of Community Colleges. Uh, he has a Master's of Education from Teachers College at Columbia University and a Doctorate of Philosophy in Higher Education Administration from University of Florida. Continuing over, we have um, uh, Andy Jacob, who's a principal uh, uh, in ATMF Realty and Equity Corporation, a real estate and private investment company in Michigan. And he's a board member of New Horizons Worldwide, which is a computer training school operator and franchisor with 30, 350 centers in 55 countries. And he's also a governor and treasurer of Cranbrook Schools, which is in Bloomfield. Uh, Thomas Howlett uh, is going to be our final speaker. Um, he's CEO of the Gugazian firm. It's a Michigan law firm that pursues class actions and other cases. Um, Tom and his colleagues served as class counsel for a class of about 3,000 current and former students uh, in a federal lawsuit in Detroit against a for-profit school, which was resolved last year and is currently pursuing uh, several other class actions against for-profit schools on behalf of students. So we've got a pretty interesting panel who represent a raw, broad set of perspectives, uh, national, Michigan, um, within the industry, outside the industry of for-profits, and we're hoping for an interesting discussion. Each speaker is going to speak for 10 minutes, and then we're going to start um, asking questions of the, of the panel and start a good discussion. Thank you. Thanks, Sue. Uh, delighted to be here. Uh, the growth in proprietary or for-profit colleges is, in my judgment, the single most important institutional change in higher education in modern times. Not only do enrollments of these institutions constitute a tenth or so of total enrollments, but a much larger proportion, uh, looking at the margin, as high as a third of the increase in enrollments in recent years. Now, I was brought here, I think, to point out some positive dimensions of this important force in higher ed, and I will do so, but I have to say some things that make my friends in the for-profit sector rather uneasy. First, this sector's rapid growth is a byproduct of a highly dysfunctional and irrational system of federal financial support of higher education. Let me just barely touch on two problems with federal financial aid today. Professor Dynarski is the expert on this. Uh, first, much federal aid, notably the student loan programs, is tied in part to the amount of institutional fees and charges 
a system that sometimes works to incentivize schools to raise those charges. If institutional tuition goes up, the subsidized student loan uh, to students goes up as well. Second, there is almost no conditioning of the aid to, uh, uh, on either actual student performance or on expected student performance based on such good predictors uh, as high school grades or college entrance examination scores. Students who are very unlikely to succeed are given as much aid as those who are much more likely to be successful. Now it's true that for the for-profit institutions disproportionately serve students whose academic backgrounds is more marginal than average, uh, although there's a lot of heterogeneity in the field as we will hear later, uh, and proponents of student college access should applaud this general uh, mission of the for-profit since these schools are helping an underserved portion uh, of the population get a chance at a higher education. Thus, the for-profits, in a way, are at the forefront of those actually doing something to achieve the higher graduation rates acclaimed by President Obama and others like the Lumina and Gates Foundation. The for-profits are under frontal attack these days. We're told horror stories that undoubtedly are true, in many cases, of individuals with extremely weak backgrounds being enticed into schools on the basis of misleading claims about probable results. Default rates on student loans are relatively high amongst these students, and we're told that proposed new gainful employment and state licensure requirements will help stem abuses. Yet I think an objective evaluation of the evidence, and admittedly the evidence is extremely limited owing to a lack of good performance measures in all of higher education, but I think a look at the evidence that is available gives a more nuanced and mixed picture. Uh, before even discussing it, it's important to remember there are vast institutional differences inside higher education. And even looking at means or medians of data often obscure important truths. Moreover, it may not make even sense to look at a statistic that compares students in a class of institutions that includes, for example, Harvard College with students in a group that uh, including, say, Ashford University, a mostly online university attended mainly by working adults. That said, however, most aggregate statistics that I look at that compare the for-profits with public or private nonprofit institutions do not show the for-profits in particularly bad light. The last data I saw, for example, show the for-profits have slightly higher retention rates on average for full-time students than do public uh, uh, schools. And with respect to part-time students, the for-profit retention rate exceeds that of even private non-profit institutions. Uh, although with respect to uh, for-profit, uh, four-year four degree programs, the for-profits average lower graduation rates than comparable non-profits, for other programs that isn't uh, necessarily true. Uh, I think a more sophisticated multivariate statistical analysis that controls for such things as student academic preparation, test scores, income, and the like, do, I think th this type of analysis will not and does not show clearly that the proprietary institutions are particularly or peculiarly deficient with respect to student performance. You can't have it both ways. You can't push for more Few less qualified in an academic sense students uh, to pursue post-secondary education, but then punish those institutions that cater to these needs when they uh, falter for whatever reason, when the students falter. Now much has been made uh, of the fact that default rates on student loans are higher uh, in the for-profits. What would you expect? They charge on average somewhat higher tuition than nonprofit community colleges and four year universities simply because, unlike those institutions, they're getting no public subsidies. Indeed, they pay taxes. They are more willing and eager to take the very lower income students that, most, uh, that are the most underrepresented in the college population that the administration tells us is far too small. The total cost of educating students at for-profit institutions in general is lower than at alternative schools. Another reason why we should rejoice that our debt-ridden and financially precarious governments 
have been able to turn over a growing percentage of the job of financing expansion in enrollments to this sector. True, a disproportionate portion of federal student loans goes to students at for-profit schools, but these schools are paying funds to our government to operate rather than receiving them. The total governmental burden per student on average is lower at for-profits than other institutions, especially four-year schools. Now, the Obama administration wants to impose uh, new rules on the for-profits that knowledgeable observers believe it will at least temporarily significantly reduce their growth. We'll, we'll mention two of them and come up again. The first relates, of course, to gainful employment. Under proposed rules, students would not be eligible for federal aid at schools where a majority of the students have debt to earnings ratios exceeding 8% of total income or 20% of discretionary income, whatever that is. Uh, uh, and the school can also meet these gainful employment standards by having 45% of the former graduates paying down the principal on their loans. But on the, and you know, on the face of this, this seems pretty reasonable to me. And certainly the principle of having some consequences for widespread abuse and non-payment of obligations is a sound one. But there is a problem which I'll come back to in a minute if I have a minute left. I think I do, three, four. I have tenure, by the way, so I'll keep talking. <laughs> uh, a second and more ominous uh, development is the attempt to add uh, additional and costly hurdles to entering the higher education business. In addition to requiring accreditation, it is proposed that online for-profit companies get authorization to operate in each of the 50 states. I think this is an absurd, expensive rule that will force smaller online operators out of business or severely restrict their operating authority. In a government that revels in centralized power, the sudden interest in states' rights is ironic but completely in keeping, I think, with the uh, general sort of anti-private enterprise orientation of the present administration. Uh, I, as an economic historian, I have to point out that 186 years ago, the Supreme Court in Gibbons versus Ogden eliminated the state of New York's ability to use its chartering powers to restrict competition in the steamboat business. Now, the Obama administration wants to turn regulation of inter net-based teaching over to 50 state regulators on top of the feds and national and regional accrediting agencies. Uh, uh, I think it's anti-competitive, anti-consumer, anti-education, anti-business, anti-poor person, and minority group. In short, this proposal is unambiguously and manifestly stinks. Uh, now, my main objection, however, to all of this is the lack of neutrality in the whole thing, a basic principle in economics. Treat everyone the same, level playing field. We're singling out one type of education. What, when far less than one out of every four Pell Grant recipients earn degrees in a timely fashion at such schools as Wayne State, Chicago State, Cleveland State, Cal State Los Angeles, or the University of Texas at El Paso, why shouldn't their students be barred from getting federal aid as well? At Chicago State, the six-year graduation rate of Pell Grant recipients cannot be as high as 12% and is probably in the single digits. Uh, why not impose standards not only regarding loan repayment but also on academic performance on all higher education institutions receiving taxpayer funds, not just one portion? Ironic that, ironically, that portion that uses fewer taxpayer dollars it most clearly serves those students that the government professes it most wants to help. If we're going to increase accountability, fine. But let's have a level playing field. Thank you. Oh, by the way, before my friend starts, I have a few uh, copies of a study that my assistants gave me to bring up here, and I have to get rid of them or I will not be lapped back, back in the office in Ohio. So please pick, feel free to pick one up. It's on the industry. Well, good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is Chris Mullen. I'm from the American Association of Community Colleges, where I serve as the Program Director of Policy Analysis. And after that introduction, um, what else can be said? Uh, I, I, too, was asked to kind of paint a, a landscape and a picture, and what I'm going to try and do that is with data and show really what's going on in the country in terms of enrollment uh, and uh, graduation and completion at a, at a large number of uh, public, private, and nonprofit institutions. 
uh, and we'll, we'll start the discussion there. So again, I was asked to, to, to kind of put it all out in data what, what the sector looks like and what higher education looks like. And when we start to do that, we start to realize that uh, the for-profit sector is a, is a very different sector than, uh, than the rest of, of post-secondary education. First, let's look at institutions. Now, if you look at this chart from 1986-87 to 2008-2009, you see a rapid increase in, in four-year institutions at the for-profit level. 35 of them existed in 1986-87. The number now is approximately 540, give or take, uh, how they report to iPads. Uh, but over time, what we've known is, is that this sector is primarily compri comprised of smaller institutions. If you look all the way to the right, you'll see that uh, nearly 1,500 institutions of less than two years in duration exist, right? Uh, we have approximately 900 two-year for-profit institutions and 539 four-year. Now, these definitions are National Center for Education Statistics definitions. Uh, they come from, from the U.S. Department of Education. It's, it's based upon the highest degree level that the institution offers, okay? But what's interesting, too, is you look at the distribution of students and how many students are enrolled. And a large number of them, less than 200 students, are enrolled in these institutions. So when you compare one institution, like we'll hear about later, that has, might have less than 200 students to a large institution, like a, maybe a Chicago State or somewhere that has a, a broader mission or a community college that has a broader mission and serves large numbers of students or provides more academic programs, it gets kind of hard, right? These comparisons can get very difficult very quickly. Uh, by comparison, to be as balanced as I can, this is what the distribution looks like at public two-year institutions, public four-year institutions, and private nonprofit four-year institutions, okay? So there's, there's a difference, obviously. And just to note as we move through this, to make things as comparable as possible, there are community colleges that offer uh, baccalaureate degrees. NCSS, NCES counts them as four-year degrees, so there, there is some, some overlap there, but when I talk about community colleges, it's the public two-year as defined by NCES, okay? And that has implications for the number of students we enroll and things like that, so these might be very, little, very a little bit from what, we, what you might hear otherwise. But essentially, like I said, this makes comparisons extremely difficult. As it relates to enrollment, uh, between the fall of 1998 and the fall of 2008, there's been a lot of growth, right? The for-profit sector has grown from 334,000 undergraduate students to, uh, to 1.2 million, which is a percent change increase of 270%. Now, at the same time, community colleges have, have grown from 5.2 million students to 6.6 .6 million students, or uh, 1.3 million student growth. So in real numbers, we're serving more and more students. Percents change, they're growing a lot, a lot quicker. What I found fascinating when I started to look at the research and dig into the research, and, and the part of the reason, I, I released a policy brief two days ago that says just how similar community colleges in the for-profit sector. My job at AACC is to inform our members of timely topics. I write quarterly policy briefs. Every three months a new one comes out. This is a, kind of a timely topic, and therefore or, I wrote a paper about it to help inform our membership. Um, but what I found interesting when, when looking at the other sector, which kind of for me, and I'm, I'm still grappling with it and I don't fully understand, the large number of full-time students that enroll at for-profit institutions, when we hear the narrative that it's the working student and, and, and those types of things, it's, there's kind of like this disconnect for me, and I, I just don't fully understand it. Uh, but we see at what would be most comparable to community colleges, which are your for-profit two-year institutions, I think it's 88% of, of students are enrolled full-time. Now, this is going to have implications for graduation rates. You take that with your short-term programs, right? And what you have are uh, an, uh, uh, an obvious uh, result of, of higher graduation rates, right? You're taking smaller, smaller schools, full-time students, and shorter-term programs as compared to community college admission, which is much more uh, uh, diverse and broad. And it's really hard to say that we're just the same or we do the same thing, right? Uh, when you look at undergrad enrollment in for-profit and public tier institutions by race and ethnicity, you said community colleges enroll the vast majority of, of uh, minority students in the nation, right? I circled over there the public two-year, which is our community colleges, and the middles are public four-year. Now, I think in fall 1998, it could be incorrect, as uh, for-profit institutions enrolled approximately eight or nine percent of all students. Some, some cases, their, their cumulative percent, right, the 4.8 plus two would be less than eight percent for American Indian Alaskan Natives and for uh, Asian Native Hawaiian and Pacific Islanders, but higher than the eight percent for Black or African Americans. So they do enroll a, a, a fair percentage, is what the data shows, right? compared to their overall share in the, in the marketplace of 8%. So the, the, there's been rapid growth this decade in the for-profit sector, as we are aware of. Um, community colleges enroll a greater number of part-time students, and community colleges serve the vast majority of minority populations. As it relates to completion, 
this is where things, again, continue to get a little bit different and where we, we can talk a little bit. Um, in 2007, community colleges awarded 515,231 associate's degrees, right, which is 60.5% of all of our sub-baccalaureate awards. Uh, For-profit senior institutions are, are more engaged in the certificates, as we talked about before. They, about 35% of their awards were uh, associate's degrees. Again, relying more, more heavily on certificates. Not saying that one's better or worse, but, they're, but they're, they're, they're different in terms of you're talking about time, because what we hear often is our graduation rates are better, our graduation rates are better. Well, if you're running short-term programs with full-time students, one would hope, based upon how you define graduation rates in the time of 150%, that they would be better. Which leads us to the next uh, slide, our next conversation, is that oftentimes we hear about this 22.1%, right? Community colleges have a 22% graduation rate. We have a 59.7% graduation rate. We do such, so much a better job. Well, that doesn't include our whole mission, right? Community colleges serve both for degree awarding, for transfer function. We serve uh, students who are coming back to retool for the job they're currently in. We serve students who are, are looking to change jobs. We serve uh, students who are home for the summer from the four-year institutions who are looking to take a course or two to catch up or, or to, to get ahead or save money. Uh, so it's, it's broader, but that 17.8% is, is often overlooked. So that still puts us at 40 to 60, which would like to be higher, but acknowledging that these measures were developed for four-year institutions, uh, HGOA of 2008 has put together a committee on measures of student success to try and re-examine the best way to measure what community colleges contribute to society and for their students. Uh, we are undertaking our own voluntary framework of accountability that's looking at data not only along uh, academic progression, but also uh, workforce outcomes. And we're having conversations about student learning outcomes and how do you really do that, which is another topic for another day. Tuition and fees, again, it's, it's very different. Now the cost per taxpayer thing, we can, we can debate and argue that for a long period of time. If you look at some of the calculations and some of the reports that are out there, uh, the way that accounting standards work for federal reporting, Pell Grant dollars at for-profit institutions are counted as tuition and fee revenue. So all of a sudden, there's no taxpayer money going to these institutions. Now, that's not fully, fully accurate, right? It doesn't count for loan money either. At pu public institutions, it's counted as a scholarship or, or counted as a, a, another, another way. It's the FASB and GASB, and we can get more into that. It's, it's part of my brief now. But it is to say that it's, uh, we're cheaper. Now, the big concern, obviously, is the explosion in the use of, of Pell Grant funds at for-profit institutions and, and some of the, the practices that have uh, Follow that. Uh, the Senate Health Committee has said that this is widespread and it's examining 15 institutions. We just don't know. I can't sit here and say as, as somebody who's a trained analyst that I know for certain it's widespread. They found it in, I think, the 15 of the 15 institutions they, they visited. So, uh, and, you know, how, how much is that really the case? We're not too sure, but it is. Uh, was in every single institution that, that, that they visited. But you see a large growth of 254%. Uh, uh, I'm going to try and point to it real quick. Uh, no, nope, I'm not going to be able to do that. All right. Uh, at, at, the for, at the proprietary for-profit sector compared to 79.2% growth over 10 years. This is what it looks like in, it, this is what it looks like in gra uh, the graphic is sector shares, right? Again, community colleges educate 44% uh, of all students in the country, right? Uh, for-profit institutions. Uh, do less, and I'm getting a signal, so we'll kind of move ahead. Uh, the, only 25 institutions receive 40% of all Pell Grant funds. This is the concern, right? With our federal loans, community colleges, only 10% of our students take out federal loans because of the way we're financed and structured. We can talk about the high tuition, high aid, low tuition debate uh, compared to 88% at uh, the for-profit uh, sector. But this is the one thing I want to get to before I, I head out is so on, on the blue bars are the total unduplicated headcount for an entire year, right? The 07, 08 year. And the, the graph on the left is for all public institutions with 18.6 million students enrolled throughout the whole year, unduplicated headcount. And at all for profit is 2.6 million. Yet they have the same number of people falling into default, 104,000. So in terms of the magnitude of people entering default, it's the exact same across sectors, yet the public sector serves 18.6 million students. The for-profit sector serves 2.6 million students. And that's a concern for the, because of the implications of uh, uh, default on the students and individuals, not, let alone the society, right, that comes afterwards. 
If you look at community colleges, not, we serve 20 times more students than the for-profit two-year sector, right? We had 49,000 people who borrowed who went into default. They had 35,000. So it's not exactly flat and level, but it's pretty close and pretty, pretty near the same. Uh, these are the def default rates as we talked about, uh, or you've heard about before, I'm sure. Uh, we're at 10.1%, the for-profit sector at the bottom is 11.6 for the whole sector, 12.4 for less than two years, 12.6 for two years, and 10.9 for four years. And lastly, as we know, coming down the way, there's, there's, there's ways to get around the cohort default rate, uh, there's to extend the time that the student actually gets into this, this, this metric or this area, and so they're moving to a, a three-year cohort default rate, and when that happens, you see the numbers change uh, su substantially. So that, uh, that'll be coming uh, in the next couple of years here. So with that, I'm happy and appreciative of the opportunity to be here and, and talk with you, and I look forward to any conversations uh, we have. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Andy Jacob, and uh, I am the for-profit business person that came on this panel. I'm not at all worried because we don't take any Title IV money, so we didn't do any of those bad things that uh, they just talked about. Uh, what we do uh, in the for-profit sector is we're primarily a training company. We operate uh, 300 training centers around the world in 55 countries. We're the largest Microsoft training partner in the world. We are also Cisco training partner of the year last year. Uh, we've looked at the accreditation model many times. We have an application in. We're not sure we even want to go that route. But uh, because we turn away 10 consumer students, and a consumer student to us is someone who is not attached to a corporation, because we turn away 10 consumer students for every one we accept, we are looking for different ways to train people who want our services but can't afford to pay for it with their own dollars. So what are the benefits of for-profit education? Well, from our point of view, the first and most important reason students come to us is accelerated learning programs. We can take someone and put them through our training modalities, and we can get them certified or get them trained to a skill level in less time than traditional educational operators. There's more focus on the student need. We're more concerned about um, whether the student has had a good experience. We use something called metrics that matter to measure student satisfaction with both the program, the, uh, the um, environment in which we train, and the instructor. Any student who doesn't give us at least an 8.5 out of a 9-point scale gets a phone call from one of our quality control specialists and determine what was really wrong with the program. Um, most for-profits have a very strong uh, career and job focus, and the students in surveys cite that as one of the reasons for coming to for-profit institutions and to us at New Horizons in particular. We also are very flexible in how we schedule. We publish a, uh, a public schedule of all our courses. It's on a, a global website, and um, we basically have any sort of training certification that you can imagine for IT, and it's available usually starting, if not every other week, at least once a month. We have different modalities that we use to train our students. We have something called mentored learning, which is a self-paced uh, uh, learning environment that has a certified instructor in the room. If the student encounters any difficulty in this self-paced program, he can signal the mentor. Uh, the mentor comes over, helps them get through the difficult portion of the material, and uh, keeps the student focused in, on a certain schedule. There's also breakout sessions, periodic assessments, and so on. A lot of students like that because they can come in at 8 o'clock one morning and spend a couple hours. They can come in at uh, 6 o'clock the next night, spend another couple hours. So it's a very flexible way to get a certification. We also have online live, which is basically our distance learning uh, modality. And uh, that's becoming increasingly prof uh, uh, popular with the students. It's very much like a traditional instructor-led classroom, except that it's virtual. And of course, we have ILT, instructor-led training. Now, the interesting thing about for-profit education is that we have to push these different flexible modalities because we're really catering to the needs of the student. Um, and we don't take Title IV, so we're not bound by the strictures in those regulations. So basically, we give students what they want. And the interesting thing about what's happened over the last three years 
is that I'd say three years ago, 75% of all of our training was delivered in the traditional format, instructor-led training, and today, 70% of our training is either mentored learning or online live. And I think this has tremendous policy implications for where education is going in the future. Adding new program. This is something that for-profits, I think, also do at a much more rapid rate uh, than the traditional not-for-profit sector. In our company, the 10 most popular programs that we have today, only two of which we even offered nine months ago. Now, we're in IT, we're, we're a special case, but in fields where education is evolving rapidly with regard to course content, I think the for-profit sector does a much better job of keeping up with the demands of the students and the demands of the marketplace. I think for-profits also do a, a good job with job placement. Now, I can't speak to you know, the for-profit sector as a whole except you know, the statistics that are published by organizations like um, ACICS, which accredits a lot of for-profits, which report you know, mid to upper 70s placements, but we at New Horizons have a job placement rate that's over 90%. Now, bear in mind, though, that a lot of our students come to us from corporations and they're already employed. They're just seeking to upgrade their skills. In terms of public policy uh, considerations, it seems to me that the innovations that for-profits have undertaken in the education field and the strong marketing efforts that they've undertaken over the last, say, decade has brought a higher percentage of people into post-secondary education. And I think whether you look at the 18 to 24-year-old group or the 25 to 44-year-old group, and it's that latter group that we serve at New Horizons, there is a higher percentage of both of those groups today engaged in post-secondary educational activity than ever before. And I don't think it's a coincidence that that has occurred at a time where the for-profit sector has grown so precipitously. Online delivery is something that is uniquely suited to the for-profit sector and really something that I think the traditional sector, while they dabble in it, is never going to push fully. And the reason is this. First of all, public colleges, and particularly community colleges, which derive some 70% of their funding from state, local, and federal governments, usually have a mandate to serve a given geographic area. What we've discovered with our online live delivery is we have students really from all over the eastern and central time zones sign up for our classes. I don't think that a community college in the state of Michigan, for example, is going to uh, really garner a lot of students from Florida, Mississippi, Ohio, and so on, and still satisfy um, the governments that fund them to the extent uh, that they do. And so there's a natural limit to how much I think the, for the uh, not-for-profit sector is going to push this kind of technology. Furthermore, when you look at traditional colleges, and you can take U University of Michigan uh, as an example, not to pick on them, but I think it's pretty typical. U of M has about, four, about 16 million square feet of buildings that are used for the campus and the educational uh, um, effort. They have another 12 million square feet approximately of auxiliary buildings, but if you look at the 16 million square feet and divide that by the 40-some thousand students, that comes out to about 400 square feet of building, physical plant, uh, for each student. Now, I know over at the Ross School, because I made a donation there, that building costs about $800 or $900 a square foot. Traditional uh, college buildings are probably upwards of $500 a square foot. That's about $200,000 of investment for every student that sits in class. There's obviously implicit subsidies that go into uh, that, that, um, that space because they're financed with usually public money. They don't pay real estate taxes, and, and so there's really no level playing field between for-profit and not-for-profit education. The reason that this is important from a public policy standpoint is unless you look at all the cost inputs, you really can't decide what the most effective way is to educate someone going forward. When you want to get a higher percentage of the people involved in post-secondary education, there is a limit to how much money that's, there's going to be available. And you want to make sure those dollars go as far as, 
as you can make them go. Scalability is another factor. Because the for-profit sector doesn't invest so heavily in fixed assets, they can scale up and scale down uh, much more readily, especially because there's a large component of online delivery going on. So there are criticisms of the for-profit industry. Um, basically, from where we sit, you know, we're not subject to those criticisms because we really answer mostly to, uh, to the corporate sector. If we don't do a good job, the 60% of our repeat business won't come back and repeat. So we have a big incentive to, uh, to do it right the first time. But it's interesting when you look at the spending data, and, uh, and Chris was mentioning on the tuition side how the tuition is so much lower at um, community colleges. When you look at the data, though, from spending from 2006, 2007, the two-year public colleges spend $11,600 per full-time student equivalent during that period, and the for-profit schools spent $13,848. So it's sort of interesting that they've spent more money per student during that period than the uh, two-year public community colleges. All in all, I'm very much in agreement with um, Rich when he says that we have to consider all the inputs, all the cost inputs, in order to determine who's really doing the best job. And, uh, and I think from a public policy standpoint, what's going on in the debate is really counterproductive to determining whether or not students are being well served by both traditional and for-profit education. Thank you. Good afternoon. I'm Tom Howlett. I'm uh, an attorney here in Michigan. I graduated from Michigan Law School 20 years ago and uh, I've been practicing law back in Michigan now for about 12 years and for the last uh, five years my firm which is a plaintiff oriented firm representing people and families who uh, have claims arising from misconduct of one kind or another uh, one of the types of cases that we've been handling has been um, cases arising from uh, claims uh, of uh, fraud and deceptive trade practices and breaches of contract by for-profit schools uh, we hear from uh, dozens of students each week who uh, have concerns about something that's happened to them in a school. I did tell Andy that uh, we've yet to hear a complaint about New Horizons, um, so um, he uh, is not anybody that we have any concerns about. But um, as a result of the work that um, we do, um, we have gained a little bit of understanding about um, uh, the problems that arise in for-profit education. I wanted to try to uh, touch on some of them today. Uh, I wanted to just share with you the kind of model, as I understand it, of for-profit education. It's sort of a three-legged stool, as I, as I view it. One is uh, the, the, uh, the owner of the school has to devise an educational product to sell. And it's, trip, it's, it's frequently uh, training and a career path as opposed to what the traditional public uh, colleges would offer. The second leg of the stool is a a securing accreditation from an accrediting entity and a license from a state in which you're going to operate. And then the third leg of the stool is revenue, which typically comes from either government loans, Title IV funding, or a, a private source. This, the slide says private lender, but to be a little bit more accurate, although it often is Sally May or a private lender, it can be just, uh, I mean, some schools that are out there look to employers or individuals to pay for it. And we do represent people who have tapped out 401ks or, or whatever to, to go to a for-profit school. Um, in my experience, then, there are uh, five problems that I would, I would want to touch on today that arise in the for-profit education realm and the common strand in these problems that arise in my view is a lack of transparency in other words these problems while they exist are not clear to the student who is making the decision to enroll and commit you know typically um, uh, thousands if not tens of thousands of dollars to a program and the five problems i'm just going to touch on this afternoon are uh, problems in accreditation and licensing problems with credit transfers, problems with the cost of the programs, problems with uh, the sales targets that exist in the admissions process, 
and then finally problems with actually measuring placement and enrollment in these programs. With regard to the problem of accreditation and licensing, um, students have a basic understanding that they should be going to a school that's accredited and licensed, but the, they don't understand the gaps and weaknesses that exist in our accreditation and licensing system here in the U.S. Um, as an example, the state of Michigan has an agency that, that theoretically regulates and does license more than 400 proprietary schools uh, operating here in the state. It's actually 450 schools, and it's up from about 250 just 10 years ago. <clears throat> but they only have a handful of, of regulators available to enforce state quality standards and resolve formal complaints. In fact, it's, it's my understanding from having spoken to uh, somebody at the state agency recently, they actually have two people that, that are responsible for, regu for, for doing inspections at these schools uh, who've been under travel restrictions due to state budget cuts, so they haven't been able to visit the schools. And as a result, it's difficult for them to even meet their, their goal of visiting each one of these schools every three years. So that's the regulatory framework in our state for doing a site visit as a state regulator to see if a school is, is, is doing its job. There are similar gaps, in my view, in, in the accrediting agencies in the United States. There are at least 70 different accreditors out there recognized by the Department of Education who can give the, the stamp of approval that a school needs to claim it's accredited and then turn around and uh, eventually apply for Title IV funding if they want. But the uh, accreditation, re accreditation process at these entities varies widely. Um, in this breach, in my view, we have things like what, I, what we're encountering in one of our cases right now, which is a, a defendant we are pursuing claims against that claims to be accredited by the International Accreditation Agency for Online Universities. It's a very official sounding name. It's our position, based on our research so far in the case, that they have no physical address on Earth. Uh, we have been asking and asking the, the, the company that claims to be accredited by this entity to just tell us where their accreditor is based, anywhere, on the globe, so we can go and ask some questions and we're still waiting for an answer. And, you know, again, from my perspective representing students, uh, that's just a, a problem a, 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 your typical student is not equipped to deal with. When, when, a, when an entity is saying it's accredited, you, you take them at face value and you have no basis to know who really has accredited them and, and uh, what that means. We also have a problem with credit transfers in for-profit schools. Um, and the problem really is that students only discover really after the fact that the credits that they are earning are ones that they can't um, use to further their education at another institution. Uh, it's basically in a problem with an inability to transfer credits, um, and this is something that's not covered uh, clearly enough in the admissions and registration process. Um, it will be sometimes mentioned in the fine print of a catalog given to a student uh, at some point during their uh, registration, but it's certainly not anything that is, is described clearly to students during the admissions process. As a result, you have people, for example, um, not to pick on Ohio or anything, but in Ohio, who are, who are currently pursuing associate's degrees of applied science, associate degrees of applied business. Either, you know, our, our sort of basic understanding would be that means that you can perhaps then go on and, and get a bachelor someday, but it's in cosmetology or um, massage therapy or something like that. And even though they have an associate's degree, it's not the type of associate's degree that is allow, allows them to enter a four-year institution as a, as a junior. Another problem, and a significant problem, is the, is the comparatively higher cost of, uh, of programs in for-profit education. And um, it, it only becomes really uh, apparent to students 
once the disappointment is set in with, with a particular program that they have, have been per, enrolled in. An example of that in which we are currently dealing is a school called computertraining.edu, which uh, for 15 plus years offered six month training programs preparing students for Microsoft certification tests. They were basically preparing students to take tests that allowed them to become Microsoft uh, certified IT people. And they also represented that they would offer ongoing placement services in the IT field to their, to their students and graduates, basically lifetime career placement. The cost of the programs, six month programs was $28,000. And in December of last year, the schools in a hard economy uh, with problems and with their private lender and other problems simply closed all their schools. Midstream students were enrolled in programs um, and, and there were thousands of graduates out there who uh, uh, were expecting to get career, uh, lifetime career placement and it's no longer available. There's a problem with sales targets in admissions and this is something we really haven't touched on today but Truthfully, at many for-profit schools, admissions reps and enrollment counselors are basically salespersons. It's not unlike those great scenes in Glengarry Glen Ross with Alec Baldwin and Jack Lemmon. You have student, you have you have people having to meet daily, weekly, and monthly quotas for sales. The students are turn, are referred to as leads. Prospective students are referred to as leads. If you can get them in the door, they're called to sit for an interview, for a meeting. And if you can get a, convert a seat into a start, you achieve something. In one of our cases, we learned that one of the ways that they tried to generate leads was by having a free nacho stand in a hallway of a, of a school where if you, if you as a student gave the admissions department the name of a friend that the school could contact, you'd get a, a free plate of nachos. <clears throat> Obviously, in this kind of environment, there's, it is ripe for misrepresentations. Um, one of the problems that exists out there is that uh, there are per capita payments made for getting prospective students in the door. Uh, at call centers, people are given a, an amount of money if they can get somebody from the phone line into a physical office for, for a meeting with an admissions counselor. Uh, we've had a case where uh, the admissions reps who are compensated more than their professors uh, received training trips to Aruba, um, Key West and other warm climbs in the middle of January here in Michigan. And uh, uh, some of the executives at these schools are offered cash bonuses if the enrollment targets of the schools are exceeded. As a result, one of the primary problems is what, what uh, is called negative reverse selling. The illusion that there actually is an admissions process at a school when in fact um, there really is none. Um, this is an excerpt from uh, an internal document in one of our cases um, where it's described that, the, that the, net, the most prominent technique in admissions is negative selling, reverse selling. Tell the person, the prospective student, not why you should come here, but why should we let you into our school? Uh, there are essays that uh, sometimes are uh, a requirement of the admissions process. Why should we accept you? And this young woman says, thank you for taking the time to read my essay. I hope you will accept me as a student at your school. Well, the truth in the case was, as it came out in deposition testimony, these admissions, these essays were never read in the admissions process. Were, you needed to have the person fill one out, but they were never read by anybody. So as I said, they're in truth, low or no admission standards. This is testimony from one of our cases. This is the director of placement. He's asked what qualifications does someone need? He says, my understanding is GED or high school equivalent and eligibility for financial aid. Question, anything else? Maintain a pulse was his answer. So uh, another problem uh, is with the final problem that I want to touch on was, is with the measuring placement and employment at for-profit schools. And the metrics for success of these programs are very difficult to gauge. There's a real difference between graduation rate and placement rate, and neither is very clear to a student enrolling in a school. You can have a 10% graduation rate at a school that may still claim a 90% placement rate, 
because they're just placing the students that graduate and, and they're successful in doing that. And so people don't necessarily know what questions should be asked and they're not getting uh, clear information in the admissions process at some for-profit schools. Um, graduation rates are, are often not disseminated even to employees. And in this, this clip that I'm going to play for you, which is just about a minute and a half long, there are uh, a handful of officers, directors, or employees of a for-profit school with a reported graduation rate, reported to the government, of 10% testifying under oath they do not know what the graduation rate of the school is. The final person in the clip is an avuncular looking guy, bald headed, and he'll, he'll finally come out and say what he understands the, whoops, the uh, graduation rate to be. Let me see if I can get this to play. Can you see uh, graduation rates, it the overall graduation rate the Academy of Portfolios, 10%. Uh, yeah. Is that number consistent with your general recollection of the graduation rate was at the Academy? I don't know. Do you know of anyone being like, across the campus who's involved in calculating graduation at the moment? Do you have an understanding as to what the Boston campus graduation and do you know how the academy would have a graduation rate for the academy? You're, you're indicating that the number I forwarded to you, which is 10%, seems slow to you. Well, 10% for the whole time that the school's been in business? Yeah. Uh, well, for any period of time, does 10% seem accurate? Graduation? Yeah. I would, I would not think so. Well, what, for what percentage of students who start the academy uh, during the time that you work there graduate? Okay, so finally, that gentleman testified under oath that the graduation rate in one of the programs at his school was 8%. Um, placement rates, which I, as I said, were different than graduation rates, which are often not known at all, are also, also can be elusive. What does placed in a job mean? Well, it's often in some, in some schools interpreted as meaning employed in any job, including the one that the student had at the time of enrollment. So if you're in a job, if you're working at the time that you graduate from some for-profit schools, you're considered placed. In one of our cases, this included a waitress at a golf club and a post office custodian, each of whom were graduates of a paralegal program, but they were counted as being placed because <coughs> they uh, had jobs. Um, in, a, in a case we had, we asked the director of placement about these impressive statistics. For a 35-year period, they'd had 3,595 graduates, and 3,511 had found jobs, over 96% or whatever that works out to. Do you know whether those are accurate? The director of placement's testimony was, I have no idea. So some of the, some of the rates that are even given to students are, are elusive. And that's why, in my view, the, the federal government move towards some sort of gainful employment rule makes sense. I just have a uh, commend this article, this op-ed piece by Jeremy Den in the New York Times to you. He is a professor at a for-profit school in Denver, and among other things, 
his view is it's disturbingly easy to get accepted, receive thousands of dollars in loans, and then flunk out with crippling debt and no degree to show for it. The business model for for-profit schools may pay off for shareholders, but it clearly isn't as effective at educating students. From my perspective, um, I'm inclined to agree with that, and that's why I think the, the regulatory effort at the federal level right now is, is a good thing. Thank you. All right, thanks to all of you for some uh, provocative um, uh, information and comments. So uh, if any of you have uh, questions right now, uh, we, can, we can take those or I can get the ball rolling if you don't have any at hand. Yes. It seems like most of the concerns you bring up about for-profit schools could be applied equally to two-year schools or, or any schools. Uh, it doesn't, I mean, except for a couple of those, I'd be concerned about that happening in any particular school. Yeah, I think that um, that's probably true. And the for-profit area, you do have the issue of the cost of the education being substantially higher and the debt that that we're talking about a student having incurred being greater. Uh, but I mean, and I think from a public policy, I'm certainly, I'm just a lawyer trying to help individual people. I'm not a public policy person. I would say the one reason maybe that, that from a public policy standpoint, it makes sense to approach the for-profit sector first is the, the loan default rates being so disproportionately high. But, that, but I agree the problems that I'm pointing out are ones that might exist in the public sector as well. I think like Professor Vetter wanted to get in here and yeah. the wants to answer too. I love that question. I come to my university and I'll give you 12 hours of credit without even working. Uh, uh, not really. Uh, uh, Do you get nachos for that? <laughs> <laughs> the Jerry Dan quote was great because exactly this goes to the, the student's point. It applies to every, inst it could apply to thousands of institutions. You know what the four-year graduation rate reported by ADPADS for the University of Texas at El Paso is? 4%, not 8%, 4%. Now, sure, there probably isn't as much on average federal money going to that school per student as at some for-profits, although there's some. But what about the university, what about the state of Texas is a subsidy of the school, which is thousands of dollars per student probably. Uh, I think it's a universal problem. I think uh, we need a, more accountability in higher ed. I absolutely agree that there are uh, scuds balls out there that ought to be uh, thrown out of business and uh, thrown in jail, do whatever you want with them. But at the same time, let's create an equal, a level playing field. Let's treat everyone the same. And that's all I, I you know. I'll answer briefly. With all due respect, I, I disagree with the with the sentiments expressed. I don't think you're going to have those types of admissions practices or or or, or deceit happening at, at public or nonprofit institutions. I, I just I don't see it happening. I don't I don't see anybody saying, well, we'll let everybody in, but I'm going to act like you can't get in. So I, I would with the with the, my commenters up on the on the stage. Uh, but why are only at four percent graduating at the University of Texas El Paso? Are, is it, I haven't studied the institution, so I can't, well, I, I can't get to so it. <clears throat> maybe their mission policies aren't pr particularly pristine, too. You know, it's possible. It's possible, but we don't know that, so we can't state for a fact, and it doesn't speak to the, the question. I let, me, let me interject for a quick question, a quick uh, point. Uh, I was told to repeat the question for the people who are watching online. So the, the question that Elias uh, uh, laid out was, um, uh, it seems like a lot of the practices that were described might also operate in the traditional public uh, in private post-secondary sector, and so why uh, should we be concerned about those as well? So, Chris, keep going. I'll, I'll, I'll keep it short so we can answer lots of questions. Well, I, I'd like to add a little something to that. Um, first of all, I think from a public policy standpoint, you have to admit that uh, the quality of the students you're admitting are going to impact all the ratios that you come up with. The graduation rates, the placement rates, the default rates, um, I, I know this from my experience in, in all forms of education, that if you want to improve your statistics at a school fast, become more selective. And, and if that's what we're trying to measure here, then the things that the Department of Education proposes are, are fine. Uh, I don't think that's the point. Many of the, many of the um, 
comments that Tom have made, uh, has made go to what I would call Federal Trade Commission type issues. You know, uh, these are things that happen in every business. We have a law now in Michigan, uh, and I remember when we didn't, that you have to get a written estimate at a car repair facility before you, uh, before you are obligated to pay them. If they don't give you a written estimate, they do the work, you don't have to pay them. There's all sorts of disclosure issues in every business that lead to poor business practices. The question from a policy standpoint is, what kind of education is taking place in those institutions? If that's a proxy for bad education, then that's a fine metric. But if it doesn't go to the quality of the education and the, and that the uh, student is getting, those are different kind of business issues that come up in every business situation. Chris, want to get one more sure. quick? Well, I, I just, just to. I don't want to be a, a combative here the whole entire time because that's not the intent. I think that, that education is valued for everybody. But I, I would say along your selectivity point is an emerging trend. A lot of the analysts predict that there's going to be a decrease in, in for-profit enrollment over the, at least the next year until these regulations play out and, and we see what happens. We saw decreases from you know, University of Phoenix had decreases. And what, what I find fascinating, I think it would be great for, for the researchers in the audience because I know our, our audience here is researchers, is um, the role that predictive analytics play in opportunity. I think that these, uh, the large publicly traded institutions that have like the Kaplan commitment and the, the UOP three week orientation, we know from research that these, uh, you can predict within the first three weeks whether or not somebody's gonna be successful or not. So it's like this post entry admission type of idea, right? And so as some of these institutions start to become more selective, they're gonna try and make their money from what I read in terms of the SEC reports and, and their, their, their statements in terms of the retention idea. So this idea of now they provide access for some groups but they're pivoting and shifting, so I think the I think in the Chronicle recently wrote a report on they're really shifting the way that they operate, I think. And it's, it's going to be fascinating to see whether or not those predictive models, uh, the responses to, to uh, interact with uh, academic advisement to help these people be successful, or to have them leave the institution so completion rates go up. I'm going to insert a question that has been um, sent from the audience at the UM Detroit Center. Um, so the question is, uh, Mr. Jacobs said that the for-profits can train people faster than the traditional sector, um, what data supports this statement? Uh, that data is really um, strictly from our company, from New Horizons. I don't have any direct data that is for the industry as a whole, except a, a study that was done, I think, in the mid-60s that was done by the uh, uh, National Center for Education Statistics. And they said back then that there was like a seven-month difference based upon completion rates of associate degrees. But given the rapid growth in the industry since then, I'm not so sure that that would hold true today. But, but my comment was basically based upon our own experience and the overlap that uh, we have with some of our courses with community colleges and the markets that we serve. Right. I mean, we, we provide contract training and, and, and non-credit training, too. It's very short term as well. And so we, we operate in the same space. So it's, it is hard to say the non-credit data isn't fully there yet, so it's hard to, hard to track uh, besides an anecdotal institution by institution basis. So I don't, I don't think that can be a generalizable uh, statement, but it, but it is uh, it's true in certain places, possibly. Yep, go ahead. Uh, this, is, uh, this question is for Andy Jacobs. Uh, in the next two years, uh, what areas does New Horizons see that will be downscaled for training or education? So the, the question to repeat it is, uh, uh, for Andy Jacob, uh, what uh, aspects of your business do you see being downscaled? Uh, we, we don't. We see in the next two years that the demand for IT training is going to increase dramatically. Um, that's partially due to where we are in the refresh cycle with the Microsoft products that make up a lot of our our training business, but also the move to um, using more and more uh, internet for everything. Uh, increasing bandwidth requires new router technology, voice over IP technology, um, hacking. I mean, we do a lot of work with ethical hacking and security things. These are only increasing almost geometrically. So we, we see from the IT training standpoint a vast growth in the business over the next few years. Yep, back there. Uh, this is a question, I think, for all the panelists, although it was brought on by uh, something that Jacob brought up, which is spending per pupil. Um, does anybody have any figures on what percentage the for-profit colleges, or what percentage of their total outlay is for marketing? And, you know, I'm wondering if your figure of 13000 per head included marketing or whether it was, let's just say, solely for education. 
Well, so that, the question uh, uh, relates to spending per pupil in the for-profit sector versus other schools, and in particular, how much is spent well, on, um, on marketing. And I can see Rich uh, flipping through his report trying to find that statistic, and while he, while he cheats, I will, uh, I will let somebody, <laughs> let somebody well, else. It, it, it's, it's hard to tell now. The cost per instruction is very difficult, too, because we talked before about accounting standards and different things are categorized different ways. So to, just to pull a number from the Digest of Education Statistics, and compare the numbers you can't really do because of differences in accounting standards. What the Senate Health Committee did find was, I think up to 31% was spent on, on, on marketing, if I remember correctly. So uh, we did an informal survey, very informal, very quick, of just 12 of our colleges. So by no means am I, yeah, but about 2 3% of our budgets, comparatively. The, there is a much higher percentage spent on what you call marketing in the for uh, uh, profits. There's no question about it. Uh, 2008, 2009, iPads data is, isn't broken out exactly marketing. There's a category, for example, student services, academic and institutional support that is as much as 60% of total spending uh, uh, in the private for-profit and it's more like 30% in the private non-profits and even lower in the publics. Uh, part of that, though, is not marketing. Part of it is other things, including placement. And placement uh, might be argued as an important student service. But I, you know, I, 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 talking to Andy Rosen at Kaplan and other schools, I'd say a quarter of their budget uh, goes for marketing. Yes, yeah, that includes that, those numbers. Also include uh, the incentive payments and stuff like that. So that number, the percent, decreases a lot, right? Which is again, which is what makes these comparisons so extremely difficult when you're talking about the finance data. I saw another hand up over here. Yeah. Uh, yeah, uh, Dr. Mullen, I'm wondering if um, something were to happen with the process of regulations and bring a lot of these down, um, could the community colleges scale up quick enough to address that need, the current 2 million, 4 million students that are uh, being educated in the for profits and then the 20% growth that they're, they're having? Okay. So let me, let me repeat the question before you. Uh, so the, uh, the question is about the, um, whether if, if indeed regulation kind of um, um, constricted the for-profit sector, could the community colleges uh, fill in and take those students? Right. Well, it's important to understand that the, the gainful employment regulations would impact about 7% of community college students uh, currently. So, you know, there would be some, some capacity there. We're currently in the process now of understanding capacity at our institutions uh, in terms of uh, physical capacity, uh, funding capacity, and those things. So I don't have an answer for you at this particular moment. Uh, clearly, there would be some people who, who would need access, especially when you have uh, public four-year institutions capping enrollments. Um, so it's a question, I think, that's a, a valuable question that we, that we need to understand better. Brian? I wanted to kind of go back to some of the proposed uh, changes, kind of gainful employment rule. Um, and if partly to kind of summarize kind of what is the essence of that again, I know uh, Professor Vetter started to do that. Um, but also, I'd like to hear the perspective of the panelists on what uh, are the potential problems with the proposed rule and what would be a better rule if one could decide and let's, for now, kind of assume that it can be applied equally across uh, for-profit and not-for-profit um, institutions. Okay, so uh, we're asking, Brian is asking that um, the, the panel uh, tell us what they think of the gainful employment rule as currently proposed, and in particular, if it were uh, applied to all institutions, um, what do you think are its, its strengths and its flaws? Uh, what's your dream list? We're, uh, I'm... <laughs> There are some problems, there's some significant definitional problems, I think Sue probably knows better than I do, of uh, what they are. Uh, for example, because of the heterogeneity of the, the types of institutions, how do you treat uh, certificated programs vis-a-vis -vis two year programs, vis-a-vis -vis four year programs in assessing uh, something like this? where you have quite a different mix in the different kinds of schools. That's just one example of a problem that you get into when you try to set a uniform rule. Uh, I often wonder why you don't carry the program on if you're, if you're worried about the federal outlay of money being, the federal government not getting its money back, which is essentially what's partly at stake here. Why aren't you looking at Pell Grants, too, uh, uh, in a more, Dramatic, uh, systematic way, 
and looking at people who receive Pell Grants, who, which are grants, not subsidized loans in, 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 in many cases, uh, oh, why aren't you putting more emphasis on Pell Grants than on loans? Uh, Pell Grants uh, are a greater amount of emphasis. That's another concern I have. But the biggest concern I have is, and let me use the University of Michigan as an example, since you're a, a, a big shot here, Brian. Uh, or at least you, you, you started the session, so I assume you uh, uh, I'm trying to up his profile. Yes. That's fine. Uh, and we have a world watching this on the internet. His beta is available on request. No. Uh, uh, the uh, University of Michigan is universally viewed as one of the greatest public universities in the United States. Uh, some would say the greatest. Its success arguably has come largely because it has been very successful in turning customers away. Its success has come because it's turned down people. The for-profits have a different way of measuring success. And their way of measuring success is how many people can we take? Now they're taking them for greedy, pecuniary reasons, but they're taking them nonetheless. And so them uh, taking in less qualified students is a virtue and not a, a defect. And I think that if you're gonna have gainful employment rules, you need to reconcile this uh, problem that we have, namely that in higher ed we don't know how to measure anything. The University of Michigan, is it really any good or not? I have no way of knowing. Because they don't provide us any good information to let us evaluate that. Would you like to jump in? Just to speak to the, the gainful employment question that led off uh, the response. Again, the gainful employment uh, provisions, as I understand it, is a way to operationalize this term gainful employment that's been on the books for a while. And so they're looking, how, how can we define that, right? It's nice to say there's gainful employment. So the scope and the, what they can uh, address is, is narrowly fit to um, that, those institutions that are responsible to, for providing gainful employment, right? So to your point, spread it out everywhere. That's kind of taking one idea and, and, and running all over the place with it. Um, those of us who work with data, I've been fortunate to, to, in my life to be able to work with workforce data and understand uh, the workforce outcomes of students and, and um, Moving along, no, it's very difficult. There's a lot of considerations. At, at AACC, we're on our voluntary framework of accountability. If you've, anybody who's looked at you know, you, you know, UI wage data or data from sole proprietors from uh, you know, SSA or, or military and trying to link all those and put them together, it's, it's extremely difficult. So uh, it's, it's, a, it's an admirable task, I guess, to operationalize something that's kind of just been out there for so long. Um, but but you know, it, can be, it can be challenging. I think the problem with loan default measurements are the same in education as they are in any other business. The higher the debt load, the lower the income of the borrower, the higher the default rate. That's just axiomatic, whether you're a homeowner or whether you're a student with a student loan. That doesn't necessarily talk about program quality. When Congress authorized the Higher Education Act in 1965, they could have said, look, as a condition of getting a student loan, you have to undergo a credit check. We have to make sure that you can pay us back. They didn't do that. They didn't do that because they want to maximize access to post-secondary education. The problem that we have here from a policy standpoint is, how do you determine which program is doing the job and which one isn't? And to use a proxy, that relies heavily on demographics and other statistics to try and measure that, I think is a failed proxy. There are other parts of the gainful employment regs um, that to me should, should be completely unobjectionable, including requiring uh, institutions to provide prospective students with graduation and job placement rates. And that is something that definitely does not go on and why the graduation rate of a school should should not be completely transparent when you're going through the admissions process is beyond me. And you know, so I'm hopeful that something like that certainly will go through. And then I guess also just to maybe expand the, the answer, you know, the gainful employment, which is the one that's getting the most attention and the most uh, 
public discourse and the most uh, marketing directed at it by the, by the for-profit schools and full-page ads in the New York Times and what have you. Um, it, you know, there are also other changes that are afoot that will be implemented uh, uh, that I think are, are great, including eliminating a bunch of safe harbors in the incentive compensation realm that uh, uh, you know, will, I think, put a stop to some of the problems that really do exist at some for-profit schools, including a safe harbor, for example, that allows managers and supervisors at for-profit schools to get bonuses as long as they're not, that relate to enrollment, as long as they're not directly involved in the admissions process. Uh, giving bonuses to incent to internet-based companies that drive students, a prospective students drive leads to schools but aren't then involved in the admissions process having incentive-based compensation to those internet companies is currently a safe harbor that doesn't violate the rules. That's being eliminated. And then eliminating token gifts is being eliminated, which will end the, the free nacho program, I think. I'm going to put in a question. Uh, so I'm going to abuse my, my privilege up here. So uh, um, I've mostly studied the traditional post-secondary sector, much less the, the for-profit sector. And I was struck, um, uh, Tom, when you were listing the five problems that you see in the for-profit sector, that so many of them had come up in um, discussions of the traditional sector. So um, shopping for accreditation. Um, uh, also occurs in, in the nonprofit sector, for example. Um, issues of credit transfer, so articulation agreements between community colleges and four-year four, four colleges are a huge problem in most states, and, and students at community colleges have difficulty taking their credits to, to BA institutions. Employment outcomes, we know very little about them in the traditional sector as well, uh, and of course, private colleges are, are, are quite expensive, so I missed the fifth one, but in any case, you get the point. All right, so there are a lot of the same problems in the traditional sector, and my, my, the way I'm starting to think about it is that Perhaps the problems are quite similar, but in the for-profit sector, it hits the student directly in the pocket because they're paying for it, and we don't notice it in the public sector so much because essentially the taxpayer is paying for it. You know, so the fact that it's so cheap at a community college or at a, you don't believe it, but it's actually cheap here um, relative to, say, Harvard, is because the public sector is subsidizing it. And so the risk is spread out across everybody, and no one student necessarily sees uh, and, and pays for the bad outcomes. So discuss. <laughs> Who you asked, everyone? I suppose there was a question in there. Yes, yes, anyone. Well, I, you're absolutely right. So it's an asymmetric information. I don't know what it is, but economists would have fancy terms to describe it. Uh, it's a question of visible versus invisible costs. Uh, students see what they're writing. They're writing a check. They see, feel the pain. Uh, the taxpayers as a whole do not feel the pain, at least that they, they know about, they don't even know what the pain is uh, from the losses on these loans and so forth. So there's a tendency where there's a, a bunch of people who are visibly lost, losing, uh, they get agitated, they hire our good friend at the end, who I'm sure is a great lawyer who will win them millions of dollars. Uh, they do a lot of, of things because they're very upset. Uh, but the losses uh, to the rest of the public uh, to uh, in the traditional sector are invisible. They just aren't 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 uh, seen. And Chris, in, in your answer, can you um, also respond in part? There's a question from the UM Detroit Center, which is how much um, uh, is contributed per student uh, in public funds. So how much do state, um, federal, and local entities contribute to the costs of community colleges? That, that varies across states. In 25 states, there's local property tax contributions, and, and there's different schemes that come down and, and whatnot. Um, so it's really hard to, to, to say exactly. Um, How about an average? I can't, you know what, I can't say off the top of my head. I, the reason why I stay away by cost per FTE calculations generally is, um, is FTEs are, are, are accumulated credit hours, and um, it, it gets tricky when you start to think about um, total costs and comparisons um, due, to, due to the way the difference is, right? We talked before about the Tazzy and the Gatsby and how things are, are, are counted or not counted. Um, it's not easy. There's, there's been a lot of cost studies on the SHEO, State Higher Education Executive Officers, just talked about cost per student and for instructing students that it's one and a half times at an upper division undergraduate that it is for teaching lower division undergraduates, uh, including people at community colleges. So, 
The cost is less, but it, in terms of the actual number itself, I can't tell you off the top of my head. Okay. Right now. Then do you want to that is sauce for the goose is sauce for the gander. And the problem with education is, uh, as we've all talked about, is there's a lack of data. There certainly is a lack of disclosure probably across all the institutions. And there's a lack of good metrics to evaluate program quality that are delivered in a way to the consumers that they can understand what they're getting for their dollar. And until those things are rationalized and solved across the entire industry, for-profit and not-for-profit, you're not going to have a rational educational policy. I'll, I'll use my brief comment just to respond to your question. I do think there is one difference, and Chris talked about it, and, and I think it was the one bullet point that you weren't remembering that I had touched on, that is the sales targets and admissions. And that, I think, is the real, the real distinguishing aspect of for-profit schools and the fact that an admissions person's job depends on converting someone from a sit to a start is sort of the game changer in for-profit schools that justifies uh, different regulation.